this is a little bit of a culmination of all the topics we've talked about. We talked about scalable data. We had green plum examples. We had how do you create different clusters from Digitas early on. Then we looked at some R code for parallelizing a large scale data set. We looked at R revolution analytics and how they could take a huge data set and actually run through it very quickly. And the last section we just saw uses Hive as a way to process a huge amount of input data. Right? So if you put all of that together, that is a bit of what we have done at my company, Sonomite. So uh, we'll just talk a little bit about what we, what we do, and then we'll dive into sort of the architectural discussions. My name is Nick, just by way of introduction. So what we do is we provide outsource predictive scoring for our customers. So we have many customers that send us all their data sets. And for each of them, we have to create specific predictive models for them. All right, so pretty straightforward. The companies we work with have a lot of customers, millions of customers. Now, the value proposition is a bit different from what you might expect. We're not predicting, we're not having the best models. We're not having the most accurate models. We're not having the, uh, the top of the line scientists. Rather, our value prop is, is cheap. It has to be fast, and it has to be good enough. Okay. So what that means is, for us, from a design perspective, when we're designing our architecture, think many, many different customers sending many, many different data sets, all looking different. So it has to be horizontally scalable. So quite often, we get 50 terabytes in a day. So the question is, how do you load 50 terabytes in a day? Right? We get model built from all data. So this is another design principle. Um, the 120 a uh, million row example from the airlines, that's actually pretty small for us. Right? So if you have 300 million people in the US accessing the web, how do you build a, a score for all these users with the raw data for all these users, no sampling? So that's another design principle for us. Dynamic predictor generation. A lot of data science is involved in feature engineering. You're actually looking into the data and trying to figure out what predictors are good. You do a lot of PCA to project and things like that. That's a problem for us. When we have 50 customers, we don't have time to build predictors and to figure out what works for everyone. It has to be automated. And then, because we charge each client individually, we have to scale the cost and attribute the cost individually to each of these clients. We can't stand up a giant Hadoop cluster first without a customer base to figure out how much that's going to work. So these are the design principles and problems that we have at Sonomite. So this is architecture v3. Um, we've been around since 2009, so we've gone through a, a couple of variations. So everything we have that I'm going to talk about here lives on Amazon. If you're not very familiar with Amazon, I'll run through these quickly. At the top layer is the elastic load balancer. This allows requests to come in and distribute it to a bunch of front end servers, which is the second layer there. They're auto scaling. So we never have to manage how many servers there are. When the CPU utilization from some of those servers go up, it automatically pulls an image from S3 and sets it up, joins it to the cluster, everything is good. When things are happy, it shuts it down. All right, so that's the auto scaling API server layer. Um, and then below that, we have a web server and some permanent machines that we use for our own management. So all our model management is done through a web interface stored in MySQL, and it kicks off jobs through a scheduler. On the right-hand side, we use Amazon dynamically generated EMR clusters. And why this relates to the previous conversation is all the EMR clusters dynamically have Hive on them and other things, HBase, some other stuff. But we dynamically generate clusters, and we dynamically set up machines to run model builds that use R and Java and some other stuff. So we'll talk about that. All our data canonical store is all in S3. So that's the current architecture. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about how we get there. So one of the first things you think about is scalable data input. So here are some choices. You have a traditional OLAP style SMP, single node machine like Postgres, discussed by Wes, or an MPP database, also discussed by Wes early on. You have a second choice, which is to own your own, create your own cluster. How many of you have your own internally operated Hadoop cluster right now? One at the back. Two, three, four, obviously. So four. So that we did in 2009. That was our first choice. 
It's great, get the machines, put it into a data center, lovely. Tweaking it will drive you crazy. Upgrading it will drive you crazy, right? So sometime in 2010, 2011, we made the choice to go to Amazon to stand up a permanent Hadoop cluster, but living on Amazon. Why is that great? We can add machines to it, virtual images, without having to buy hardware and ship it to the data center. Plug in the cords, we don't have to do that. So that's great, second choice. But then when EMR came out, these are dynamic Hadoop clusters that you can spin up and tear down with no management. Um, we decided that that was no brainer. So that's our current third generation question. Yes. I don't own stock in Amazon, but that's where we would start. I'm not gonna talk about how you do it, the technical parts, but if you have questions, you can always catch me later. Um, and as a definition, just so you guys know, some of you may not be so familiar with EMR. Elastic map reduce is a way where with one command, you can specify a dynamic cluster, a Hadoop cluster to stand up on Amazon, and everything will be built in. Hive, all the connections will be built in, and this is crucial, it has access to S3. So what Morali was doing was he had to write studies and things like that. Well, guess what? Hadoop and Hive will be set up. He can actually put his studies distributed to all the nodes dynamically when you set up that cluster, one command. You can add more nodes to it. If it's too slow, you can add 500 nodes to it. One command. It won't start up in one second, but it'll take some time, but it will add 500 nodes to it. When you're done, you say, I want to shut down 500 nodes, but leave the name nodes, leave different nodes up running. That's what it will do. It will just do that. And of course, you have different servers you can get, small, big, medium, large, etc. Okay, so that's what this is. Now, there are some problems with EMR. So it's not a database because it's not Hive. Hive is not a database. There's no loading, right? So databases are great because you load data in, it indexes, it does all the transformation in the columns. But if you have 100 terabytes and you're trying to load 100 terabytes, that's gonna take a while. And dynamically stood up clusters don't have that luxury of being able to do that. Of course you can. You can put a machine on it, put an MPP on it and load, you can. But EMR doesn't do that. So you have to set up a catalog, so you have to create tables. You have to run create table statements every time you bring up a new cluster. The setup and teardown is pretty slow. Query performance obviously is also slow relative to machines that have preloaded the data. But obviously if you compare preloading versus non-preloading, you're not comparing the right thing. So here's an example of um, some of one job that we run fairly, fairly regularly between uh, more than tens of these every day. The master node is an R3X large. I'll talk a little bit about that. The core nodes, um, so it sets these up. So core nodes are the nodes that have data on them. You can also set up task nodes, which have no data on them, but will read the data from the core nodes. The first step is we typically pull down any additional data we need from S3. We run the DDL script. The DDL scripts are all stored in S3 because your EMR cluster can access that, right? So the cluster stands up, it pulls down the DDL script, it runs a, create, a bunch of create table statements. So now Hive knows, okay, I know where your data is. Then it generates um, a series of Hive queries on our side. Our software generates gigantic Hive queries, then it runs, and the Hive query, which is what Morali's team was working on earlier, will generate your training sets and your scoring sets, et cetera. And all of that is pushed back into S3. So now if the machine dies, all of that data is available, it's still in S3, so you can pick up from there. It installs the, our, our packages, obviously, uh, you use your own packages, you do your own thing, so you need to be able to pull that down and install it. And then runs the scoring job, pushes it up, and then shuts the whole thing down. That's an example of an EMR job, they call it a job flow, with different steps. Uh, we, we do have an SLA, so we try to make sure every one of these runs within an hour. And the way to make it faster, just scale it up. Get more nodes if it's too slow. Or get bigger nodes, depending on your infrastructure. 
Questions? Yes, absolutely. So we have a cost. The question is, how often do machines fail? And the answer in our experience, by the way, we have run over, we have run tens of thousands of clusters. That's what we do. And we're seeing failures one, every, one to two every 200 clusters. In fact, this morning I got an alert saying that one of our clusters that we set up failed. And this is a point that we have later, which is we have a cluster manager. You have to build a cluster manager or use something like uh, some other tools out there. Your cluster manager has to build in retry and timeouts into your cluster management. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so model, that's the data preparation, as you would call it. Lots of data, scrunch it down into a training and scoring set, maybe a summary set for loading into a data warehouse, et cetera. Now, how about model building? So you've heard a lot about R being not scalable in a bunch of different ways. But this is one of the machines we use for model building and scoring. It has 32 cores and 244 gigs of memory. You can get it for 30 cents an hour. So I can pull that up, and it will read S3 data. Okay. So there are questions about parallel. You can parallelize it. You can use for each. You can use parallel package, whatever you want. You may have to write some of your own parallel code, but that's pretty big. So do any of you have our jobs that you think that will not fit into? 244 gigs of memory. That's a spot price, so Amazon has three-tier pricing, on-demand pricing, reserve pricing, and spot pricing. So spot pricing is a spot market, meaning whatever unused capacity they have, you can use it. That, yeah. Now, it may change, obviously. It goes up and down as they provision more and as more people start to use it. But that's what we've seen. And obviously, if you're smart about it, you won't probably need that much capacity all the time. So for your smaller jobs, you'll be provisioning smaller machines. Uh, so our cluster manager is smart. It predicts whether or not there'll be terminations in the, in the pricing, whether it goes up. So it picks the AZ, the availability zone, and it sets the price. And it falls back, so there's a failover. So after n number of times failover, it spits back to on-demand pricing. One out of 200. Yeah. There it? That's the no, that's the machine, the machine itself. A price of the machine. Um, S3 pricing, um, you, you, can, you can do your own calculations, but we have an example later that we can talk a little bit about. All right, so this is kind of hard to read, I'm sorry, but let's try this. So. One of the reasons why we went from one big Hadoop cluster to spinning up many small ones, smaller ones for each, is because of the big issue, the big job issue. Very often, you will have a big job that's running, and even with fair scheduling and a whole bunch of other things, you will have queries that are lined up behind it, waiting. So it's easier to, if you have the ability to spin up individual clusters and access the same data, this is the key, the same data, then that's a better way to go. And that's one of the reasons why we went down this path. So a big giant customer would, would hog up other customers in the background. So that's why we went this architecture. Um, second thing, uh, EMR is, is reliable and works. We've, we've done this for the past two years. We have run thousands and thousands of clusters, and it's fine. No worries. The sizes range from 10, 15 nodes to we have 100 plus node clusters that spin up and spin down at the same time. So it's fine. Now when you start up, for a company that's starting up, Amazon will restrict the number of nodes you can set up. Uh, so you're gonna have to work with their support to scale it up slowly. Uh, EMR updates. So Amazon, what's interesting about that too is the managed cluster updates itself. Amazon updates the software they have on it. So it used to be Hive 9, then it went 11, now it's 13. They update it. So when you spin it up, if you're expecting a specific version, you can specify it, and that'll be installed. So you gotta watch out for that. Retry logic, timeout logic into your cluster manager. That's very important, as we talked about. One to two failures every 200 plus clusters. 
optimal, optimal pricing and availability zone, that's, that's what we talked about too. Um, we rec what we do is we, all our R packages that are specific to us, we write our own R packages and we load them up into S3 and then the clusters will just pull them down and use them, right? Uh, paralyzing, all that kind of stuff we use. Now, quite often you will have the question of where do you run certain operations? So a lot of times you will use R for summarization, right? So that was an example. You summarize 120 million records, and that's great. But you kind of have to think about where you want to do what each tool is really good for. So for EMR cluster, we can, run, we can do a sum of 50 terabytes. It might be hard for R to do that. So you kind of have to define where your cutoff point is and pro offload the really big data stuff onto EMR and Hive. So we have, as an example, we have a 50 plus terabyte customer. Data came in in a whole batch. Um, and this is important, parallel loads to S3. So if the customer has a Hadoop cluster of their own, they can in parallel load up as long as they have enough bandwidth. So that's why you can load up a huge amount of data in a very small amount of time. Data partitioning we talk, um, that was talked about briefly. EMR jobs, daily transfer, ETL, summarize, all of that's done on a daily basis. Occasionally, once in a while, there's a table scan when the models are being refreshed and rebuilt. Um, so as an example, a 50 terabyte S3 cost is about 1,500 to 2,000, depending on how you do it. Uh, there's some Glacier. Glacier is low redund uh, lower sort of archival, and then lower redundancy. So S3 stores data in general in three data centers. Uh, that's more costly. If you have them only stored in two data centers, it's much cheaper. That's what's called reduced redundancy. And that's it. Yo, just, just over. Any questions? Yeah. What's your Joe. AWS bill? Sorry? What's your bill every month? It's thousands. <laughs> just bear in mind we have a lot of customers. And we're spinning up thousands of clusters. It's a very really good question. So all our code is designed uh, in such a way that it is going to access a cluster. But before it accesses a cluster, it checks to see if the cluster exists. If it doesn't, it calls the cluster creator. So all of these are abstracted out. So if tomorrow Amazon died and we had to shift to another cloud, we will basically look at the abstraction code and add in another plugin for each of the parts that's currently using Amazon. So remember, we moved from our own Hadoop cluster to the Amazon version permanent to the dynamically generated one. There was very little, let's say, core code work done. It was just more plug-in building. Like right now, would you consider it? Sure. If, I mean, we would, obviously, if, if things came along, sure. But we sort of haven't had the time, this investment in Amazon. OK, so the question is, is data IO the main bottleneck? So I grew up in the data side. I grew up in the 80s time when data storage was a big deal, right? Relational databases, relational concepts were built to reduce storage, right? Now I think that's no longer the case. So IO is the bottleneck. Um, but I think that uh, if you were to stream out parallel a lot of machines, that might change. Yeah, so data, this is the, the data strategy. So there's a bulk, there's a bunch that came in, and then they're getting updates regularly, and then we're moving things off into Glacier as and when we don't think we need them. Yeah, yeah. Question up there? Yeah, so you say you're using as you are. The storage is on S3. No, so Amazon, the EMR system, Hive can natively access the S3 data blocks. Okay. So if you have 128 megabyte locally, you can push that up to S3, okay. and the system will recognize that and do all the splitting and all that kind of stuff as well. So what do you do? Like your name? 
So Amazon, when you spin up an EMR cluster, everything is smooth. There's a name node, there's a master node, that's usually in the master node of the cluster. The core nodes contain the HDFS data locally. If you create any temporary data sets or whatever you run that's temporary can be stored there. Is there any memory? Um, that's a function of how you, you can specify how big that node gets. So you can take that 244 gigs node to be your name node. Gigs of local memory? Yes. RAM? Yes. Okay. Right, yeah. So you can use that as your name node. All right. Thanks, guys. So lunch is served. Enjoy yourselves.